Well, good morning, Austin Oaks Church, friends and family. So good to be with you. Um, thank you so incredibly much for praying for um, Pastor Seth and I while we were in Rwanda um, not too long ago. Um, for those who are visiting friends and family, my name is Brandon Ziski, the lead pastor here at Austin Oaks Church. Our heartbeat is to be simply all about Jesus. And I cannot wait to share with you just a snippet of what God did in our time in Rwanda. Now, rest assured, there's going to be a time when I'm going to unpack more. We're going to set up a time to do that and also to dive deeper into what God is going to be asking us to do in terms of partnership with African New Life. But if you were with us back in 2019, let's say around like November, December, and into early January of 2020, uh, we felt compelled that God is asking us as a church to dive deep into generosity, to learn about generosity. And we felt very led by the Spirit at that time to, we need to eliminate whatever existing debt that we have as a church. And uh, by God's grace, God moved in the heart of his people and we eliminated the debt in quick fashion. And part of that also was um, Pastor Charles was here and he was preaching um, somewhere in December, and uh, as we sent a team in 2019 to go to Rwanda, they were sharing some things and their experiences, and they were talking about this village in the upper northeast province of Rwanda. And I was like, man, I feel like we should be doing something there. And so when Charles um, came, he was preaching. If you remember what it was like, if you were here, I basically said in front of the church, kind of a little bit of a surprise, a little spontaneous, and I said, hey, we're going to fund that church plant that you want to build in Nagatari, Rwanda. And he looked at me like, are you kidding me? I was like, no, nah, we'll do it. We'll, we got it. And so we threw that out there as a church and you all responded by God's grace and generosity. And we raised $150,000 to plant a church. And so by God's divine providence, we were supposed to go to Rwanda last year, but this thing called COVID happened. We weren't able to go. But then we should, went this year, and it was the exact time when they were finally able to finish the construction. And so they were going to have their first Sunday celebration service during our trip. And so Pastor Seth and I got to be part of that experience. Well, I wanted to share with you, okay, a video highlight of that celebration Sunday. And I want to tell you how significant that $150,000 went Okay, so I want you to enjoy, I don't think that's working. It's not working. We've got a video for you to watch up over here. God has time to this congregation. They asked you to give them an obedient heart. That they shall follow the leadership of the church. But above all, they shall follow Jesus. They shall make disciples in the hills. They shall grow men and women to Jesus Christ. They shall build their families and build their communities. They shall live an exemplary life in this community. They will not become a burden to the government or to the community. But they shall be blessed workers. As servants of God. So, Father, in your name, we bless them too. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about it. Amen. God bless you. The church in Karangazi extends deep, deep gratitude and thankfulness to us as a church. We can't even begin to connect the significance 
of that gift. $150,000 did a lot of things. One, it built the largest church building in that whole area, the largest building that you would see anywhere. And it was really nice. And church buildings don't just operate as a Sunday morning service. It's a community hub. It's a civic center. It's where they do weddings and parties and all sorts of things. It's where children gather. It's a major deal. The, the um, lieutenant governor or mayor showed up too and was just expressing gratitude and thanks to the church of Austin Oaks Church in Austin, Texas. When, the, when Africa New Life goes into a village, they plant a church. And that church building then gives them access to be able to build in a child sponsorship program. And this past summer, when Pastor Charles of African New Life was here, we said, hey, we want to sponsor the first wave of kids in Karangazi. And there were 70 kids at that time, and our church sponsored 59 of those. Okay, now since we did that, there's now over 1,700 kids sponsored in that area. Think about that, 1,700. Child sponsorship there, like, I'm just going to be honest, like, I was always a little bit skeptical of sponsorship programs because some agencies somewhere down in the past did some sketchy accountable accounting things that made me always nervous. You don't know where that money's going to go. But when, you, when we went there, it was amazing to see what that $39 a month would do in terms of child sponsorship. And these kids now get food and clothing and opportunity for an education. And then we get the opportunities to get into the homes with parents and, and start to come alongside them and teach them a trade so that they can make a living. I mean, it is remarkable. They get medical attention and all this kind of stuff. And so by the generosity that we did, 150000 we can't even fix an air conditioning here for 150000 like, we were able to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ in a powerful, powerful way. And we got to hang out with the kids that our church sponsored this past Sunday. So if we got the slide of the group picture with all the kiddos on there, I want to share this with you. Those are all the kids that this church sponsored this past summer. And it was amazing just to be with them and the joy. And I got to hang out with the two kids that our family sponsors. And I got to meet their dads and talk with them and hear how significant this is for them. And so if you recall, on Easter, if you were with us, we had those beach balls. Well, we had an abundance of beach balls. And we took them all with us. And so we uh, took them there. I think we got some pictures here of um, trying to inflate them. Okay, it was exhausting. We had to manually do this. So we inflated all these balls. These kids have never seen one of these before, right? Like for us, it's like, are you kidding me? But it's just like, they, this was like the first beach ball they've ever seen. And we had to teach them how to blow it up. It was so phenomenal. It was so much fun. We were absolutely a sweaty, muddy mess at the end of this. Seth was so tired that he passed out in the car in the most ridiculous way. If you want that picture, just email me. I will give it to you gladly. There's so much more that I could share and talk about. It was phenomenal. But I want you to hear on behalf of Africa New Life and the people of Karangazi in the Nagatari region, thank you so much. This was the first service that they attended in over a year and a half because of COVID. People walked two, three miles. They don't have cars. They walked just to get there to worship Jesus. It was amazing. So thank you so much for responding. And I'm telling you, there is so much more that the Lord is stirring up, but we're going to have to hold off for another time. So buckle up. This is going to be a, a really fast and significant sermon this morning. When I was in Rwanda, I felt compelled to change the sermon series to take a pause from the Gospel of Luke, to dive deep into something. Now, I know it's going to be tempting to think that we're just doing this because of our experience and our time in Rwanda, but it's not. Trust me. This has been something that the Lord's been putting on my heart for about nine months, and I just said, I will get to it at some point. And it wasn't until last Sunday when Pastor BJ preached a phenomenal sermon. In fact, if you haven't heard that message, just get up, leave, put it up online and watch it. I'm kidding. But no, listen to his message. That message moved me. And I was like, yes, we need to talk about this. So for the next five to six weeks, we're going to pause the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to take a deep dive into what worship is. Now, I'm not talking about living a life of worship. What I'm talking about is our corporate time of gathering and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a significant thing that God has given us. It is a gift of his grace to give us the ability to come together with people who follow Jesus to worship him together. It's not just something that we do on a Sunday morning and it's a discipleship issue because a lot of times people come into Sunday morning not even understanding or knowing why we do what we do. 
In fact, a lot of people are like, oh, we just sing some songs, and that's just kind of the appetizer for the main meal, which is the Word. And so I will skip the music part just to come to hear the Word, and then I'll leave. No. All of it matters. It's a significant thing that God has given us as people to worship Him. In fact, from cover to cover of the Scriptures, we see just how important it is to the heart of God that people come together in corporate worship. Now, let me just clear the air because I know, I know that when we start talking about this, our guards come up. In fact, I know that's why a lot of times pastors don't preach on this is because they don't want people to think that we're doing a little bait and switch. Hey, our attendance numbers are low. We need you to get to church. Hey, our giving's low. We need you to start giving more. No, it has nothing to do with any of that. And I know it's tempting to start thinking like, oh goodness, are we going to become that church? whatever that church is. I mean, when we think about worship, we immediately think through some denominational filter. And we think on this like, extreme ends. We go to the far right where it's like ultra-reformed, super conservative, dogmatic, and then we go to the way far left. We're like, these are the crazy Pentecostals. <laughs> Why didn't that one get any laughs? <laughs> Why? Why was... But it, like, honestly, I hate that. It just muddies the water. And both of these like, extremes are just knee-jerk reactions. Oh, I don't like this one. I'm going to swing way over here. Well, I don't like this one. I'm going to swing way over here. But scriptures actually teach us something that I'm going to talk about this morning, the both and of worship. The both and of worship. The Father is seeking worshipers. John chapter 4, we're going to talk about this in depth next week. The Father, like think about this, the Father is looking for true worshipers. The Father is seeking after people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not either or. It's both and. And I think a lot of times we lean in the Western world, we lean more in the truth camp, right? A lot of times it's a joke that people say within churches, our trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. All the while we neglect the fact that Scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. In fact, Scriptures even teach that the overflow of the heart, the mouth, speaks The reality is, Satan has way too much influence in this arena. Way too much influence. We have worship wars. Man, did you know that worship is the greatest thing we can do in this life? To ascribe glory and honor. And doesn't, doesn't it like then beg the question that Satan knows how influential corporate worship is, how powerful it is, that if he can muddy the waters, if he could get people coming into church immediately doing this, I don't like that song. I don't like it. Too dark, too bright, too loud, too soft, too hot, too cold, too rainy, too hot. And I know how tempting it is to be in your seats because I do this. I'm, confession, I do this. How easy it is to sit in those seats and then begin to judge the people up front. Oh, they're just performing. They're just doing this. That's not really them. Why are they so emotional? Why are they so excited? Why do they seem so passionate? Friends, I want to encourage you. When you look at Mary Ellen and Samantha and Seth and these folks up here, what you see is what you get. This is who they are. This is not a performance to them. And so in these five to six weeks, I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not going to lean one way or the other way. What I want to do is lay out the scriptures clearly and help us understand the importance of corporate worship, why we do what we do, and understand the significance and the power of this time. So that rather than us coming in and being spectators and treating this maybe as a buffet table, that we actually come in the posture of worship knowing that when we come, we offer God something. We sacrifice something to God. Yeah, but didn't Jesus already do it? Yes. But we still bring an offering. 
your spiritual act of worship is to present yourself as a living sacrifice. We are to give a sacrifice of praise. We have no clue the power and the influence of corporate worship. We look at a psalm like in Psalm 22 where it says that you, yet you are the Holy One of Israel. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel. Like, just think about that for a moment. Like, God is enthroned. He makes his throne on the praises of his people, Israel, plural. Another way in the Hebrew word that talks about it is like that God inhabits the praises of his people. Like, this isn't just a statement in the psalm to be poetic. Like, God has chosen to throne himself and throne himself on the praises of his children. We look at this in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 3, where Paul is saying to the church, Rejoice. I say it again, rejoice. And I have no problem saying it to you over and over and over because this is a safeguard for you. Like the rest of Philippians 3, it's all about how we consider everything a loss for the sake of knowing Jesus. Like this is all loss in gaining Christ, the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus my Lord. Paul is saying when you rejoice, it actually becomes a safeguard to your heart. And rejoicing is not like some like, hey God, I give you praise. Like this rejoicing is this connecting in our spirit and in truth of emotion response. Like I'm rejoicing, I'm keeping you up there and myself down here. My eyes are going to be fixed on your throne that is established and not on the circumstances. I'm not going to boast myself, I'm going to boast in Jesus alone. Chains do break in worship. God does show up differently in corporate worship. This is a significant deal. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the both and of worship. And you're going to hear me ask two questions repeatedly every Sunday for the next five, six, seven, eight weeks. Two questions. One, what is God worthy of? What is God worthy of? Two, what is God looking for? And I want you to wrestle with this. What is God worthy of? And what God is looking for? So, turn with me to Leviticus. Yes, I said Leviticus. You can preach out of Leviticus. Or so I have been told. Chapter 9. And I have to build up to get here. So I need to do kind of a quick little flyby survey from Genesis 12 up to this moment. Because otherwise we won't gra- like understand the weight of this moment. Leviticus 9 is the inauguration of corporate worship. And Leviticus 9 is the time when God lights the fire of worship. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. This story can all start all the way back in Genesis 12 when he called Abraham. He said, go to the land that I will show you and you'll be the father of many nations and that people will be great. They'll be so numerous like the stars in the sky and I will use them as a blessing for other nations. Other nations will come to know me and give me glory because of this people that are going to come from you because of faith. Well, that people grow and then all of a sudden they find themselves in, in Egypt due to a famine and their people grows and Pharaoh gets paranoid and begins to enslave them and oppress them for 400 years. And they cry out to God and God sends up Moses to rescue them out of the hand of Egypt, out of the hand of Pharaoh. And in that moment, what we see is a very distinct theme that covers from cover to cover in scriptures that God is in the midst of his people. In fact, we see this multiple times. They say, what other God is there like our God who is present in his people? Present, not like distant, not like some offset deity. No, like present, intimate, personal. To which the answer is, there is no God. 
He leads Israel out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And even when need to, he would guard their rear by his presence. He would provide for them and bless them and lead them to the promised land. And in the midst of that journey, God wanted to give them an instructions of how to live. It wasn't to be strict and rude and cruel and to be a taskmaster on Israel. It was to bless them so they can understand who they are in relation to God and that God wants to be in a relationship with them. So in Exodus 32, Moses goes up the mountain. The presence of God comes down on the mountain. Crazy thunderstorm. The people are fearing God. They don't even want to get near to the mountain. Moses is up there too long. The people get impatient. They go to Aaron, who's supposed to be the high priest, and say, hey, make us a God. And I read, I go, you guys are idiots. Like, like, you, like you read that. And you're like, I mean, literally, the presence of God is, is behind them. Thunder, lightning, shaking, and they have the audacity to turn to Aaron and say, hey, make us a God. And Aaron goes, okay. And then Moses comes down. I love this. Moses comes down and says, what did you do, Aaron? He goes, I don't know. I just put the stuff in and out came this calf. (laughs) God comes down. He punishes them because of this adultery, this idolatry. God is just, but yet God is faithful to his covenant. And he gives them another opportunity. He's like, listen, I promised you a land and we're still going to go. So Exodus 33, he says to Moses, tell this people to go. You're going to go to the promised land. I'm going to give you all the blessings. I'm going to send an angel. The angel will lead you, but I'm not going with you because of this. You don't really want me. You just want the blessing. Well, Moses tells that report to the nation of Israel, and they hear it as a disastrous word, and they repent. They throw off all the things that they use for idolatry and all this kind of stuff, and they basically say, in essence, God, we don't want the blessing if it means we don't have you. Like, that's what God wanted to get to. He's like, I want your heart. I want you to want me. And they said, you can take the promised land. You can take the angel. We don't want any of that unless you're with us. Take the world. But give me Jesus. Friends, can I tell you, that's true worship. To get to the place where we can say, God, I don't want the blessing if it means I don't get you. Because he's the greatest thing. You can take my home. You can take my finances. Ooh, these are dangerous words. I get it. You can take all this, but don't leave me. But God is so gracious and so good. And he tells Moses in that moment, he's like, listen, don't take us out of here unless you're with us. Because what else makes us distinct besides the presence of God in our midst? Which is a true New Testament theme. Emmanuel, Christ with us. We celebrate that on Christmas. And then on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls forever to dwell in our hearts. And we have the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the presence of God that makes us distinct. Makes me wonder, is this why our corporate worship can be so lame? I'm stepping on toes. Is it because we'll take the blessing without the presence? Yeah, God, that sounds like a great deal. You're going to give me the promised land and you're going to send an angel I'm good if you don't come. This is awesome. Sign me up. What's in it for me, God? I'll come to church if you do this for me. God, what about this? What about this? What about this? And we come into worship waiting to get something instead of coming to give something. When will we get to the spot where we just go, listen, I'm here because I want you, Jesus, and that's it. All of this buildup leads us then to Leviticus chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. This is why we don't read Leviticus, because you got to get through nine chapters to get to one nugget. Okay, so you go through chapters 1 through 9, and it's God saying, okay, I want you to worship me. I want you to relate to me. And he gives them, like... Do this, do that, get this ready, do this offering, bring the sacrifice, do the, all these things, get the tent ready, you gotta or, ordinate the priest and you gotta cleanse the, the, the tents and all these kinds of things. Like all this stuff to prepare their hearts for worship. All the way, and this is the verse in, in um, Leviticus 9, 6. And Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do. 
that the glory of the Lord may appear. So chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, all the list of the stuff that God's saying, bring this gift, sacrifice for the sin, for the guilt, bring a peace offering, bring a grain offering. It was all symbolic ways of helping them understand their sinful state, their need for a covering, and their relationship with God. And he's like, if you want me, prepare your heart. Prepare your heart. Friends, can I tell you something? That scriptures, when it talks about corporate worship, it always talks about the essential element of preparing our hearts. And that made me think, how do I prepare my heart for worship? How late do I stay up on Saturday night? How groggy am I on Sunday morning? Do I wake up maybe five minutes just before service starts and I rushed in? Do I prepare my heart through prayer, seasoning, tenderizing my heart before the Lord and worship, maybe laying things before him? And one of the things that moved me in Rwanda was the fact that they would walk miles to get to church and they would come early just to pray before their service started. Not only that, on Saturday night, they would come and pray for a prayer and worship service before the service came on Sunday. Like it just, it it struck me how they took the preparation of coming together significantly. We fly in as part of our Sunday routine, not always, but we fly in and also go, okay, lunch. What is God worthy of? What is God worthy of? So they bring all the offerings. Aaron brings all the offerings. He does all the things. He does it for himself and he does it for the people. Look at this. Leviticus 9, 22. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offerings. Now I want to stop and hit something real quick. Aaron lifted up his hands. How many of you have ever thought, why do people do this? And you're like, they're the weird ones. Like, this is not an invention of modern worship movement, hand raising. It's all biblical. In fact, we see this, the Hebrews understood this. Like, when they raised their hands, they understood this as, as a way of demonstrating, of saying, God, everything that I'm praying and everything I'm singing is for you. I'm ascribing it to you. That's what this ultimately means. God, it's for you. Regardless of how I feel, I'm doing this for you because you are worthy of it. Listen, I I just want to be blunt. If you do this to make yourself feel something, that's idolatry. If you do it to ascribe glory and honor to God, that's great. Because that's what this posture is. Aaron raised his hands and he blessed the people. This is a posture of saying, God, I'm offering myself to you. Here, here I am, as best as I can give it, in this moment, here. That's what these postures are. So significant. It's so biblical. It's not a Pentecostal charismatic thing. It's not a free church thing, nor is it a, a, um, a something over there thing. <laughs> he blessed them. May the Lord bless you. And keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You need grace. You need God's favor and you need his peace if his face is going to shine upon you. Because he's that holy. You can't look God in the face and live. Peace, grace, favor. This is what Aaron was blessing the people with. They did everything that they were told to do to prepare their hearts for worship. Now check this out. Verse 24. Fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when the people saw this, here's the both and. They shouted with joy. They shouted with joy. Fell face down. The tension of worship in that moment. That's what should happen when we gather corporately. Why did they shout for joy? Because a week or two ago, they just made a golden calf and gave themselves to that golden calf. 
And God wanted to restore and renew that relationship because he's true to his covenant. And he gave them a way to do that. Prepare your heart. And they brought it all. The fire coming down from heaven was God's sign of saying, I accept your offering. And they were like, oh my goodness. They were overwhelmed. Like, I don't deserve this, God. That fire should be falling on me, not on that offering. And they were shouting for joy. Why is there no joy oftentimes in the church when we worship? Have we forgotten the joy of our salvation? Like, like this is where that question, like, what is God worthy of? I shared first service, no guilt tripping here. Understand this, no guilt tripping here. This was something the Lord was putting on my heart. I like to oftentimes worship like this because I sometimes don't want to or I worship with a cup of coffee in my hand, hand in my pocket while they're doing the thing and I'm spectating. And I just like felt like God just leaned into me a little bit and said, Brandon, am I worthy of that? No guilt trip. It's a question you got to answer. I ain't going to be carrying a Starbucks in heaven. Oh, did you see, see Jesus? <laughs> when we think about Jesus and the cross and conquering the grave, how can we not be joyful? We come in immediately going, well, I don't like that song. I'll wait for Hillsong. I'll wait for a hymn. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about ascribing him honor. It's about ascribing him glory. And when we do that, it changes everything. They shouted for joy, and I'm willing to bet that was a moment. And when they shouted for joy, there was singing in that moment. And then all of a sudden, somewhere in the moment, it dawned on them, oh my gosh, fire is from me, falling from heaven. And they went, God is holy, can't believe he accepted it. And they just went, boom, at the same time. It's a both and. I get it. Ah, I get it. I've heard this. People are like, oh, I don't want to express worship unless I feel it right. I want to make sure my feelings are genuine with my expression. Have you ever thought that? I'll raise my hands if I feel it. I don't want to be disingenuous. Listen, if I only loved my kids and my spouse when I felt loving, I would officially be the worst dad in the world the worst husband in the world. Like that's why we give him a sacrifice of praise. Even if I don't feel it, he's still worthy of it. We shout for joy. We realize he's holy. We realize that Jesus paid the price for our sins once and for all. His sacrifice was fully pleasing to the Father. That means that when we confess faith in Jesus, the Father receives us based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So his grace and his favor is forever on us, no matter what. And we struggle with being joyful and showing reverence. I want to share with you something personal. And this is how we're going to wrap this up this morning. I'm going to ask the guys to come on up. The first couple days in Rwanda, I got to back up a little bit. So, it seems like the older I get, the more I realize how my childhood problems and things I experienced really influenced today. And I realized that I wrestled deeply with shame. I wrestled with guilt and a lot of things that happened to me as a kid that just kind of sit there. And a lot of times they can just be triggered and I can run that hamster wheel really fast and start to really think that I'm not worthy of anything. And I've been studying shame and guilt and that phenomenon and trying to heal. I'm like, Lord, change me, please. I don't want this. Because a lot of times I feel that way with God. I'm like, God, like you will love me when I get this right and then I'll finally be worthy and all this kind of stuff. Even though I know Jesus loves me, like all that kind of stuff, but I wrestle with it. It was total spiritual warfare. But for the first couple of days, shame was on me like I, I never felt before in a long time. 
I emailed the elders, pray for me. I mean, it, like the thoughts in my head were not good. And like I was ready to buy an airplane ticket to fly back. I had to preach and teach way more than I'm used to. And I'm like, I can't do this. I'm not worthy of this. And I remember they always sat us in the front, always sat in the front. And they always, like Seth would always say, they sat us in the front and we were always late. So it was always embarrassing. And so I had to do chapel for the seminary students. And I was like, I don't want to be here. I want to fly home. I want to crawl in a hole. I'm mad at God. I'm like, God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? I don't want to sing. I don't want to preach. I'm a fraud. I'm a phony. And they're all going to know it. I'm your pastor. (laughs) They start singing a song called The Goodness of God. Never heard it. I did not want to sing. I was in protest. But my spirit, the spirit that God has caused to live in me, the Holy Spirit, began to testify to me. Like it says in Romans 8, that I am his son, and he's near me and with me. And then I just started listening to the lyrics of this song. And the lyrics of this song moved me in such a way. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Like, I just started thinking about that. I was like, yes, Lord. Even in my unbelief and my struggle, I love you. And yes, I've seen how your mercy in the past has never failed me. All of my days have been held in your hands, and I'll just... uh, contemplating that and thinking about that and moved by that from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God and my brain remembered a psalm when David was saying oh soul why are you downcast within me yeah I will praise him and that's what I was feeling and I didn't want to but the spirit of God inside of me was like sing and I was like no I don't want to I don't even know if I like this song All my life you've been faithful. All of my life you've been so, so good. Amen. I had nothing else to say. And in the moment of the song, things started changing in my heart. The truth of God's word started to change. The second verse are speaking about like, I love your voice. You've led me through the fire. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I will sing of the goodness of God. And it was at that moment, I was like, God, you're worthy. And I just said, hey, Aaron, this is true. This is true. And then it gets to this bridge. Your goodness is running after me. And I thought of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I started shouting for joy. I felt the chains of shame and guilt break. I felt freedom. And in that moment, I had this epiphany. I was like, whoa, he's so holy. That's the power of corporate worship, friends. We just don't do this for the sake of doing it. We come to bring him an offering ourselves. And even if you don't do it, he's still worthy of a sacrifice of praise. This isn't an emotional thing. This is like, this is for you, God, because I know you're worthy. God, I don't feel like surrendering, but I know I need to, so I'm offering me. So I don't know where you're at and I don't even know how to land this plane. So I'm going to pray and we're going to sing this song. Lord, I thank you for I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've given us worship as a means of grace and mercy. Lord, I thank you that we don't worship a God that is not true. We know we only can worship what you've revealed to us. So we base our worship, our expression in truth, in scripture. Because revelation leads to worship. We don't worship imaginations and things that we construct in our minds. We worship the living and true God. 
this living and true God came to love and save sinners. People who are amazing at creating idols. People who are amazing at worshiping anything and everything. But you came. You launched the fire of worship in Leviticus. And then when the temple was built, you launched the fire of worship in the temple. And when we became the temple of the living God, you launched the fire of worship in us. Lord, we know lives can be changed. Sins can be forgiven. Chains can be broken. All of that can happen in this moment. So Lord, we're here for you. God, we want to enthrone you with the praise that is due only to you and for you. In Jesus' name.